How are you guys doing? Uh, my name is Ryan Eli Salter. I am a co-founder and chief product officer for Breadless, the low-carb gluten-free sandwich company, and also the executive chef for Salt & Co., a premium catering organization. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining this course, uh, Raising Greens, the art of raising greens. Uh, we're gonna have some fun. I have, I'm going too fast as in speech or even pace. Just let me know, slow down. Uh, I make this about every week. I'm gonna show you how to make some truffle mashed potatoes with these beautiful golden potatoes. Uh, we're gonna use some beautiful mixed greens with this kale and collars that I got from uh, Keep Growing Detroit just yesterday. And we're also gonna grill some mustard glazed corn shins, mustard glazed corn shins. So what we're gonna do first is work on the marinade for our corn shins, get that ready so we can put it into the oven. And there's something we're gonna be doing today is called active and passive cooking. So uh, the art of active, passive, art of active cooking is that we're actually gonna be actively working, watching the greens, raising them, tasting them, seasoning them as we go along. Passive cooking, you bake it, you set it, you're ready to go when you're ready to go. Put it on a timer and it's done. Um, so, and also the mashed potatoes, they're a little mix of active and passive. So I did my prep work. We have our potatoes here. I'm gonna get a rolling boil over here on, a, on my pot. I hope you guys have yours as well. Yeah, I'm gonna throw them in at the moment. If you're boiling your water, just make sure you have a little bit of olive oil and salt. And I'm gonna let them sit there for about 15 to 20 minutes. So once that's ready, we sure have the chicken in the oven and we can start working on the greens. And by the time the greens are being in the stove, we can actually pull out the mashed potatoes and start mixing and mashing them as well. All right, so give me one second. I'll be back and we'll bring out the chicken and we'll get that ready. Sweet. Hey, Cindy. Hey, Cindy. Hey, Cindy. Hey, Cindy. All right, so I'm gonna switch out my cutting boards because I'm gonna know it's gross. <laughs> True, facts. And we're gonna start working on our chicken. So my best suggestion is always wear gloves um, because you're always gonna be washing your hands constantly when you're working with chicken. You're gonna have a lot of uh, bacteria surrounding it. So before I even touch anything with the bird, I always make sure I wear some gloves. That way I can actually mix and mold and marinate my meat with my hands. One thing I like to do with my meat, beef, chicken, pork, fish, is to actually get in there and massage my marinade and dressings into there. So first thing I'm gonna do, because I had it defrosting for quite some bit, and I had to soak in some warm water, I'm gonna pat dry two birds. The reason why you want to do this is to ensure you get a nice coating and it doesn't wash off once you put your marinade on. All right. and after that, we're going to take a little bit of olive oil. And usually my technique is right hand for seasoning, left hand for massage. So I'm gonna start massaging these birds. And I actually did miss one quick step because these birds, you could massage them this way if you want to, but you can also break them in half so we can grill them a lot easier later on. So I'm gonna actually do that. So you go from the breast side, go right in the middle, and you just cut down, place pressure right in the center. But not cutting all the way through. Correct. So that one's done. The next one. And what is this technique called? Um, they call it uh, spotching, uh, spotching. And so basically, like breaking the bird down. This way allows for even cooking. Got it. So my bird is still a little bit frozen. You see the ice particles all around there. That's okay, since we're baking it, this is all is gonna keep the meat hydrated so it won't dry out. 
Is that somebody changing gloves? I'm gonna start with some olive oil, salt, pepper, and paprika. And then we're gonna make the marinade by mustard, our mustard glaze. And then we're gonna massage that into the chicken and reserve a little bit of it for later on when you want a nice caramelization of color. So, so hopefully everybody's already, ovens are preheated. What's up, Lola? So if folks have already had their um, birds marinating, should they, what should they do? At this point, at this point, if they're already broken down, I suggest if they're marrying them in the mustard glaze uh, to put them in the oven right away. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna pour a little olive oil, massage that in, some black pepper. My personal preference with black pepper is a restaurant grind to so see a bigger, more specs. Sea salt. And some paprika. All right. I can see you got a nice little red color. It's going to be a nice orange hue when we're done with this. And I'm going to turn it around and do the same thing on the other side. Some black pepper love, some sea salt affection, a little paprika pepper. And you said that these are recipes that you make regularly, right, for your business? Mm -hmm. okay. So when we do tastings, when people ask for our mustard glaze, uh, Cornish hens, or chicken, this is what we usually do for our braising methods and for our menu. So I'm gonna take that off. And I'm gonna start working on our marinade. So I'm gonna get pork. And start getting our ingredients together. So the first step, one cup of mustard. Just regular yellow mustard or stone ground. Pour a cup of honey. I'm gonna reserve a little bit of it for the greens to help break down the bitterness. Some onion powder. Some garlic powder. Just a little bit of paprika, this time, not too much. Just get it right there. Dash. And a dash of salt and pepper as well. Great. And just a little bit of olive oil. Just to loosen up the honey a little bit. So it can spread. Stir it in. Just see that nice orange color. I'm just going to pour a little bit on here. On both sides. And a little bit more on the other side as well. And then we're gonna take our birds and put them in a roasting pan or sheet pan. I use a half foil pan. With the split side down. So you want the skin, you want the top back exposed. So just like this.
Toss it in the oven. Now set a timer for about 30 minutes just to check on it afterwards. And what I have left over, I'm just gonna pour onto it at the final two minutes. All right, so let's get this out of the way. Chicken's the easiest part of this process. <laughs> Check on your potatoes. One thing I could do is check the tongs, grab them. They're not breaking. It's still in time to cook. Should they be past fork tender? Mm-hmm. Okay. You want them as fork tender as possible as makes it so you can actually cream them when you're mashing them. Okay. It makes it a lot easier. All right. So I guess what we can do is actually start working on the greens. So one thing I already wash and dry my greens. And we're gonna start slicing them down from the stock end. So you wanna watch that technique. So this is some kale I have. And I'm just breaking down. Get a fresh bowl. This is apple. We're going to throw these in here and bring them back in to do a rough chop. But right now, I want to get rid of the stalks. So you can see, I'm going to move the bowl out the way. You want to get rid of these bullies. So you have some nice, easy, tender greens. Now we're gonna use some of the stalk because I like a little bit of texture and everything I do. So this gonna give it a nice little crunch to it. And if you wanna use your stems, we did a class with uh, Warda from Warda Patisserie in um, Midtown and she also has a spot in Eastern Market. But I think our cooking class with her is still on our YouTube page. Um, but she did a recipe where she used both carrot greens and kale stalks. Ooh. Yeah, it was amazing. Did she stew them by any chance or? What did you say? Did she stew them by any chance or? Was I, the I don't quite remember. I think it was. I can find out. I can uh, find it. Also, do you ever do like a carrot top pesto? I actually love using carrot greens, and, uh, especially a little bit of dill. So I've used, uh, I actually use them as a, uh, not as a pesto. I've done it a pesto once. I've done a dill pesto. But I mainly use it actually like just cooking and braising them, just like a, as a collards and kale. Uh huh. I've even done a collard green pesto, which is very interesting. It's great with chicken. I mean, but honestly, mm. you can put anything on front on chicken and it tastes amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now this one's really interesting because the stalk is rooted. Mm -hmm. Some beautiful greens, Lola. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, so I think I got you some are like regular schmegular collards, but there's also some purple collards in there and some curly kale too. And also, I can't remember if we were talking about this the other day, but if you have kale and collards growing at home and you planted them um, this season and, and if they make it through the winter time, which oftentimes they will, um, they produce these brilliantly yellow flowers um, that are actually delicious. Um, and if you harvest the flowers before they bloom, 
you can kind of cook them. They look like broccoli rabe. Um, and you can saute them like broccoli rabe. Uh, you can roast them. Um, you can like, you can cook them like broccoli rabe. But then once they bloom, once they're that yellow color, they have this really sweet, the flowers have this really sweet flavor to them. Um, and you can kind of put them to finish off. You can put them on top of dishes to finish them off. I was putting them in like hash, uh, like a breakfast hash or, mm -hmm. um, Anything that like, you know, decorative flowers might go on. I'm a huge fan of uh, edible flowers. I love mushrooms as well. Uh, as you put them like, like, like I do like a skirt steak and he does a garnish, but they're so spicy or even for a salad. But I haven't tried the collard greens yet, but I know like since we talked about it, you gotta have to give me a, a bunch of those once they bloom again this winter. I got you. Yeah, I really wanna try that. So I'm gonna stop after these two because collard greens, I mean, they do cook down a lot, but it's a small course. So part of my problem is that I'm used to making food for 50 to 200 people. So I can sit here and slice greens all day. <laughs> so what I'm going to do with these greens, as you can see, I'm actually layering them on top of one another, mainly the collard greens. And we're going to do it a ship and hot. I think that's all of them. I'm just going to take my bunch right here and roll them. Like a burrito or other uh, favorite things. <laughs> I'm just going to do Chop. Now I was saying earlier while I was chopping my peppers, keep your arm in a claw motion. One, it gives you control of what you're doing. Also, saves your fingers from being cut. So you may chip a fingernail, worst case, but there's no blood. And also, when I hold your knife, you want to hold it like a pencil so you have your finger. It's like a finger right here, so you actually control the weight. Do not hold it like this because it's just, there's no control in the motion. So, and just go in a nice saw in motion. All right, and I'm going to do this again. I'm just going to kind of break this in half because the smaller the greens are, the faster they will cook. So I'm just gonna get a little oil pan, any kind of container, just put them in there. And once it's all done, it's probably gonna shrink to from this amount to about a handful. <laughs> okay, and then for the kale, I'm gonna bunch them up and just basically do a rough chop. And we're not gonna cook the greens at the same time. So all greens cook differently at different speeds. So cabbage cooks at a different time frame, kale cooks at a different time frame, and collards. Collards actually take a longer. So it's gonna be about 25 to 30 minutes, make sure they can fully cook through. Um, but kale literally takes five to 10 minutes. So they break down really fast. So I'm sponging it up. Doing a rough chop. Because they're so cruciferous, they already broken apart itself on different ends. Where I got it. Can you also tell us about this fancy apron that you have on? <laughs> uh, it was actually a workshop that I did with uh, Detroit Denim years ago. You make your own apron. So you go into uh, Detroit Denim, you pick out your materials, and you kind of design your own apron. So this is a Japanese salvage denim. Um, and they have like, this one material they have from 
Denmark and I said, okay, let's make a pocket here and then, yeah, something else here. So it's dry clean only. I got to spray it down and it's a pain in the butt. I try not to use it too much for work, but it's always in my car. Uh, and it's a leather, you know, you can get these gun stamps, you can do whatever you want. So they were doing workshops for a bunch of different things. You can make your own purses or your own jeans. And the workshop for the apron class was always around Christmas time. Uh, I was hoping to do it again annually, but obviously uh, since COVID, they changed their whole mode of operations. But yeah, it's, it's custom made. <laughs> All right, so I'm cutting down these stalks. I'm just gonna take a little bit of this. Again, like I said, I like texture. So we have our peppers, we have our red onions. And I'm gonna put it in the container where I have my collard greens because they do need time to break down. Now, as for the, the amount, uh, it's your own preference, like how crunchy do you want your greens to be? You may have a little bit of you know, crispness with this. So I'm just gonna use about five stalks. It's a mix of kale and collard stalks. Um, so I dropped the link in the chat for that cooking class I was talking about um, with Wada, where she um, taught us how to make a spiced greens and chickpea stew in a summer carrot salad and she used um, the stalks of the greens like we were talking about. Can you repeat that question? Oh, I was just letting folks know that I in the chat, I put the link okay. to the class we did with um, Warda where she also used the stems of the greens. So just if, if folks want even more ways to use the entirety of the crop. Actually, I do want to check out that class. I think that this. So the potatoes still have a little bit more time to boil because the uh, the burner went out. So I'm giving another five or so minutes. So in the meantime, I'm gonna start working on the greens because that's what we came for. So once the potatoes are done boiling, it should take about only five to ten minutes to finish them all. So we shouldn't be too worried about that. In the meantime. We're going to get pan on medium to high heat. Just put a little bit of oil. And the layer pan, just get heated up. Any other questions while we wait for uh, some things to go through? Yeah, let us know if you're uh, cooking along with Ryan today. This is the best time for questions while everything's actually just getting ready, you know, the main key for, I would say, uh, cooking, what I've learned is patience. Sometimes we try to rush something, mm -hmm. it always causes uh, unforeseen circumstances, uh, such as uncooked meat, uh, uncooked greens, and very gritty mashed potatoes. <laughs> Sometimes it's best just that. to wait another five minutes and it just works itself out. <laughs> yeah, so how do you know, um, oh, Jennifer is wondering, Oh, when should I plant collard greens if growing by seed? Um, it's a well, lower question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, do you want to take this one? I have a black thumb. Like, <laughs> it's, it's very salty. <laughs> that's, that's real. 
Um, if you're planting, if you're growing it from seed, you'll just want to plant them a little bit before you would plant the um, transplant. So, I mean, really in like the early spring or um, late summer, I think would be a good time. Um, are you starting the seeds? Jennifer, let me know if you're starting the seeds indoors or what your strategy is for that. But also a cool thing about um, college and Kayla is that they um, will last you a couple seasons. You can get like two full seasons out of them and they'll make them th make it through the winter and then get those flowers that we were talking about in the, in the following springtime. Okay, sweet. Yeah, Jennifer, sounds like you're on the right track. Okay, so I got my pan ready. And how do you know when the oil's ready? When it's shimmering or when you hear it crackling like it just did. So I had okay. high heat. So I just want to make sure it flies through. And I'm going to throw in my peppers and scopes right here. The peppers and onions that I cut up earlier. Let them cook down. Are you cooking them just until they're soft or um, until they have color? I cook them down. So red onions, you know, they really don't get translucent like yellow onions. But like this, like you give it about five minutes. Maybe it's tender anyway as you're braising with the green and stuff. Pick that out. It's constantly turning out. And you're using olive oil, but are there other types of oil that you would that you could substitute for? Uh, you can probably use avocado oil if you just keep the smoke point low. You can use butter. Um, that's also a good method. I don't recommend coconut oil. Uh, one for the flavor and two for the uh, smoke point. But extra virgin olive oil usually is the best. Okay. I mean, yeah, also cooking things in butter is, is always tastes good, but... I, sometimes, honestly, uh, butter and uh, oil just go really well together. The butter has flavor and olive oil can go up to 4 degrees, so it breaks are um, in parts of the gym. So, smoke point is pretty good. So, as you can see, the onions are breaking down. I'm going to take a little bit of garlic. Just Throw chopped garlic, minced garlic? That's about a hefty tablespoon of garlic. Okay. Minced garlic. Doing these cooking classes always makes me hungry. One of these days I'm going to have to <laughs> cook with you guys. Put a little salt and pepper to season. Yeah, can you talk about the importance of seasoning as you go? So, I mean, sometimes people like to season at the very tail end, but I don't believe in that. Um, unless you're doing like a maldon or fishing salt. So, as you're seasoning going along, it definitely incorporates the flavors. And you also get a gauge to how far you're going to go along. Is it too salty? Like, you want to do it beforehand to gauge and adjust as you need to. Because if it is too salty, you need to put a little sweetness into it, a little honey, a little sugar. If it's bitter, um, then you obviously adjust it as well. If it's a little bit sour, uh, you can always modify it as you go. So that's the best part about you know tasting your food, especially something like this when it comes to uh, greens, pepper, fresh vegetables, because they absorb so much of the flavors that you incorporate into it. Okay, so I'm gonna take these collards. I'm gonna throw them in with the stalks. And also, if you, I've heard that if you add, if you only salt at the end, that it can end up like ruining. You actually end up saltier. It's because all you taste is like the last bit where you're like where you're incorporating to it. 
So you're not really getting the benefits of salt. The, the main benefit of salt and garlic is really just to, not just to add flavor to food, but also to enhance the natural components of what you're eating. So it, that's why I also love, you know, um, animal, I say it, uh, sorry, that's what I recommend by incorporating salt when you're baking. You know, it actually helps the crust, you actually taste the butteriness of, of the crust itself. Um, garlic itself really brings out the peppers and the umami flavor of that. So as you're working along, you get, get, a, get a good gauge and good sense as to how things are tasting. So I'm not going to taste the greens yet. What I'm going to do is just turn around and start lowering the temperature. So right now, I lowered it to medium, medium low. See that color? Because I'm going to season it again with a little bit of paprika. Some herbs the province. Red onions and garlic, as we don't need that. Anymore. And just working through it. And maybe a little bit of honey, just to help the, with the bitterness. And the heat's still on medium, medium low? So technically honey is not vegan, but if you put sugar in it, it'd be, be completely vegan. Oh, I'm sorry. I said the heat that you're oh. cooking the collards over, those are, um, it's medium, medium low? Yes, medium low. Okay. And just as necessary. So in my ingredient list, I recommended getting some stock, uh, some stock, some vegetable chicken stock. I do use this better than bouillon. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of that. And mix it up. All right, I'm gonna finish off this can. Just to concentrate, so you really don't need that much. And I'm gonna put a little bit, about a quarter of a cup of water. Just to help. Crazy. So, as I said, taste as you go along. I don't taste collard greens right away because I actually do need time to cook it down. So, as we're doing this, in about five minutes, I'm going to add the kale and I'm going to start re seasoning the greens again. Well, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, some paprika, and herbs of province. All right. Now, let's check out problem child. How are the potatoes coming along? Let's see. Almost but not there yet. Right. Now let's check on the chicken. All right. All right, so got a nice little color on it. So it's actually caramelization. So you might not need grill marks for this one, the convection oven, but I'm gonna actually put a little bit more honey mustard on it and turn it around. Can we get a little close up of it too? So I don't know if you can see that. Yep. There's the bird. Uh, there we go. I'm trying to get the right angle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. You see like the, the color of the hues. 
This other one on the back is actually fully done. So we probably don't need to grill it, but I am gonna grill this. I am gonna both on the underside. So I'm gonna let it sit because it's finished. That was fast. <laughs> Well, 375 uh, without a uh, any covering on it, you know, it's going to tend to cook pretty fast. I'm going to let it sit and rest, and I'm going to start gauging the temp. I'm going to see if there's any redness or underdoneness, um, and then we can always gauge from there. But once I'm searing it, it can finish cooking through. So it has a little bit more time on the darker side. Perfect. And one mistake I made, you know, we all make mistakes, is that I didn't actually test this uh, convection oven because it actually run a little bit hotter than I would my oven at home. So it is getting a little bit more charred. So I'm actually going to cover it up in foil and let it finish off cooking. Turn the over. Again, just cover them up. So if um, folks at home should folks at home also reglaze their they chicken should. at this time? They should actually. Okay. Uh, it's best time. So I'll cover it back up and let it finish, let it finish cooking off. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go back to the greens. Ryan, do you also do um, a lot of cooking at home? I do when I have time. Um, unfortunately, these days, not as much as I like. <laughs> but when I can, I most certainly will. Uh, usually it's uh, something like on the grill, uh, mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese. I might actually around this time we're getting close to fall. I do love baking, so I actually make a bunch of pies. Uh, Leandra uh, from Detroit Cider Mill Farm, like she has a bunch of apples that she wants to borrow. And I usually make a whole bunch of pies, pear pies, blueberry pies, pear and blueberry, apple. We try different like, uh, seasonings and flavors and just play around with them. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite like pie crust strategy? I've been working on a lattice, but I also make like little roses with the leftover lattice. I know some people like to do like their different uh, like cookie cutters and like make like different stars and like outline them. But I'm a simple lattice guy. I don't like to do like a full cover either. Mm. And for my uh, glazing technique, I use milk, sugar, and egg yolk. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes people will put like vodka or vinegar or something like that in their crust do you do anything like that i've never used that before i i, I gotta look that up <laughs> <laughs> it helps with the flakiness i think i can definitely see vinegar doing that i've never used vodka for that but i can see the benefits So you're just reseasoning the greens. Yep, just, that, right? just for the kale. Okay, just for the kale. Or yeah, because you've added kale. Got it. Everything's breaking down. So I'm actually putting it on still low. 
And I'm gonna put a little bit more water in this just so it can uh, raise some more. Okay, get in there. I can see it. Sweet. All right, so let me get started on the mashed potatoes. And we set a timer for five minutes, so I can pull that. Chicken out sometime. All right, so one of the beauties of having a colander pot is this. Nice. And I'm going to put this into. Uh, half oil pan or flat pan. It makes it easier for mash. So as you can see here, they are ready to be mashed. And as that's going on, I'm gonna get a soft pot. I'm going to take it out for a second. I'll just stay there for a moment. And we're going to make our cream for the mashed potatoes. What's the most amount of mashed potatoes you've made at once? Um, about 70 pounds. Okay. It's about five of us literally peeling potatoes, boiling them back here, uh, four different pots. I'm using a stick of butter. And we're mashing them, we're whipping them. Uh, even this Saturday as we go along uh, for this wedding, we're doing about 125 portions of mashed potatoes. So that's about 50 to 60 pounds that we're doing. So I'm using a cup of heavy cream. And the reason why I do it is just to gauge, you don't need a full cup, but it helps. Parmesan, some truffle oil as well, some Parmesan cheese. The real stuff? Yes. <laughs> I had it wrapped up somewhere, so I'm just trying to get it out. So, Parmesan cheese. It's probably hard to see with the light. And get started mashing. So. Cut these in half. There we go. You can see they're really easy to break through right now. And if you don't have a potato masher, is there something else that folks can use? Um, for a masher, I would say if you want to get them really tender, then you don't really. Uh, you could probably use a blender if you cook them a little bit further through. You can even use a stand mixer or a hand blender. It gets through, but I just like to mash them first, break them down. 
And it's gonna be a few step process because as I'm mashing them, I'm gonna incorporate the butter and the cream that's melting. And that's just on low heat over there? Mm-hmm. That way you don't scald the butter or the cream. There we go. And again, just water them if you need to. Katie's wondering if you added the truffle oil yet. I did not add truffle oil. I actually have it right here. So I'm going to do that once I get them a little bit creamier. So we haven't seasoned. Mashed potatoes yet. And I always tell people a recipe is a guide, it's not a code to live by. So if it may be too hot for you, like white pepper or you know, too garlicky, always adjust as needed. I know people actually make this vegan as well. You can use almond milk or oat milk, and it has the same effect for consistency. Margarine also works. I'm just gonna pour a little bit. Get that milk and cream in there. Turn that burner off. Just mash it off. And that's the butter and the cream. Mm hmm And pretty soon we're gonna get our hand blender. Once we're done mashing this to make it a little bit more creamy and consistency. Yeah, but as you're talking about like the most amount, we got a large three foot potato masher and we're just mashing like a returning butter, just going like this all day. <laughs> just doing this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And sometimes that crude method actually works, as you can see, just not worry about aesthetics or how you look, just really match. Get in there, a little elbow grease, as you can see. Just breaking them down. I'm gonna add a little bit more cream and butter. I'll let that get in there. And did you salt the water when you were boiling them? Excuse me? Did you salt the water when you were I boiling did. them? Okay. Yeah, I put a little olive oil as well so they would stick. Okay. You do the same for your pasta. Um, sometimes I like to actually reserve the starch mortar. Um, it's great for sauces, uh, for especially making like a pasta sauce, or even sometimes for your mashed potatoes. If they're getting a little cold, if you're trying to do something else in the back end, and you leave the needs to like sit there and get cool, uh, throw a little hot starch water in there and it'll smooth them up as well with consistency. It's very effective. And as you can see, I'm just getting very smooth texture right now, but it's still a little lumpy. And that's where we have to whip them. But before we do that, we're going to start seasoning them a little bit. So, a little bit of salt. And can you remind us where the chicken is at this time? The chicken is actually sitting outside the oven. I took it out and it's just cooling right now. I didn't want to overcook or burn off. Sure. Because, and that's the only reason why I say that is because this is a commercial convection oven and they're doing some maintenance with the equipment right now. So it's running a little hotter than it should. So I just put some Parmesan cheese, some salt. I'm gonna incorporate a little bit of fresh garlic in here. Again, a little is relative. <laughs> Some onion powder. And the truffle oil.
And the best part is, like I said, active and passive cooking, since that's on low, the greens are just braising, they're chilling, they're stewing. They're getting all the flavors in. They're getting a nice little bath. While I'm sitting here, slaving away. <laughs> all right. So we got a nice little consistency. So we can go two routes. I know some people uh, don't have an immersion blender, um, but if you have a whisk and lost a steel whisk, you can work with this as well. So this is broken down pretty well. You can honestly just start whipping. Katie's wondering where do you get truffle oil? She wasn't able to find any in uh, ham tramic. So Whole Foods has uh, a nice assortment of truffle oil. I just like Kroger has some in their seasoning aisle. I usually buy mine online um, or I get it from Restaurant Depot. But Whole Foods um, in Detroit does have it and also the one in Birmingham. Um, the good ones I like, uh, there's a company called Truff. They make a really decent truffle oil and Leah Sandra. And Leah Sandra's uh, one that's actually imported and bottled in Italy. So you can see I'm just whipping along. And to get a little bit smooth, I'm gonna use the rest of that heavy cream and butter. Mix it in. You're gonna start seeing it break down a lot more and it starts to absorb the heavy cream. Add a little parsley as well, just to start incorporating some of those flavor components. Now we can sit here all day and uh, whip this until it gets consistency, but I actually want to use my version blender. You can see how it looks like it's finished. So it's a little Cuisinart Arts handheld blender. Use it for smoothies, stews, milkshakes. Make sure it's locked in. What are a couple of other appliances that are kind of like go-to? Hand mixer as well. Mm -hmm. I make sure it works as well because this one's gonna kind of funny with me. So I may be talking too presumptuously. <laughs> We've been uh, going through hand blenders, right? A lot, so this is our third one. All right. They're and good for like go. soup, like blended puree soups too. Uh-huh, yeah, I use it for soups, stews. Um, like I said, milkshakes is actually great for that, for blended drinks. Huh. Oh, well, I guess I won't be able to uh, show this because it's not fully charged yet, so it should be. Nope, so it's not doing what I need to do. Oh well, talk too soon. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm back to whipping it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you wanna get it whipped to the consistency that you like. So I'm just gonna do this, I know we're almost at time. To get all these lumps out. That's what you really want to do. You guys have any questions while I'm just sitting here whipping away?
Um, so does Breadless have a brick and mortar? We do. So we're actually on 2671 East Jefferson uh, right. between Joseph Campo and Larnet. And you can come through the Larnet entrance. And we're actually projecting opening for uh, fall. So we should be open soon. Sweet. What are some other dishes that you like to make with collards? Oh, um, so actually go back to breadless. Like I said, one of my favorite sandwiches, actually, um, both of them are collard green wraps. So, or we actually wrap them in collard greens. So we have one called the Garden of Eaton. It's a roasted eggplant sandwich with a sun-dried tomato pesto, roasted peppers, red onions, and Roma tomatoes. Uh, and it's absolutely divine. And the other one that I do enjoy is called Cloud Nine Pastrami. The pepper crusted pastrami, Harbati cheese, bread and butter pickles. Uh, we have our thousand uh, keto thousand island dressing. We have a cabbage slaw uh, and uh, red onions and Roma tomatoes. And it's just honestly, it's a great sandwich. And you won't even know that it's low carb, that it's gluten free. You won't really be missing bread. So I'd actually like to eat my collars raw. Uh, because they're endocarcinogens. So dark leafy greens are actually cancer fighters. Um, and as we both know, like the raw fruits and vegetables, you actually absorb more nutrients from them than they are if they're cooked. So I do enjoy the sandwiches. I get a lot of health benefits from it as well, on top of being a great flavor profile for me. Sweet. Yeah, we got to get you some of those flowers in the springtime. Yes, we do. So you can see I got a lot of those lumps working. I'm just gonna play with this some more. And I'm gonna get a tasting spoon and try it out. Very important step. So one thing my grandma always taught me, and we do in the kitchen, you don't eat from the taste spoon directly, you just put a little right here. You try it. <laughs> so it doesn't need salt, stepping creamy. My recommendation would probably be just a little bit of onion powder. It should be fine. I'm not adding more salt to it because the Parmesan cheese is already very salty. Did you do a lot of cooking with your grandmother growing up? I, I did, except for holidays. That was her day. She went to cook by herself. As she got older, she let us cook more. So my aunts and myself and um, a few of my uncles, we all get together and just um, all contribute our dishes or help out. So my one aunt, she took over Thanksgiving, and I'm basically her sous chef. <laughs> um, but I am the carver for the family. So I carved the turkey, I carved the ham, I carved the roast beef and the prime rib. When I come home, I actually don't cook that much anymore because I cook so much outside. Um, for her, I'll make my short ribs. I'll do the mashed potatoes. Um, I make my greens for her. It's funny because she told me the other day she never put peppers or onions in her greens. And I'm going to let these greens sit off, turn the burner off because I think they're done. And again, I'm just going to get a little tasting dish. Try them out. See how they taste. All right. They're good. <laughs> <laughs> good balance of flavors and all that. Good texture. It's, it's, it has texture, it has crunch to it because of the stalks, it has the pepper. It's really good. If anything, I can make it probably a little bit sweeter. I could probably do like a pot liquor, which means like you put more liquid to braise more so you kind of just drink the stew. But I actually like my greens to kind of cook all, as you see here, and save that stew off so it's actually a little bit drier. But it's also easier to eat, so it's not as messy. So I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna get this grill pan ready, and we're gonna sear that parsnip and plates and be done. So I'm 
Hey, so uh, Irma is wondering what's the address so she can swing by and grab a plate. <laughs> uh, so for Song Club, we do all catering, so you can always put an order in. For Breathless, the address is 2671 East Jefferson in Detroit. Uh, we're in the Rivertown District, right across from Borden's and also across from the Martin Building, if you recall that landmark. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, but they, they mean that they want they want some oh, of what this. you're making, yeah, <laughs> right now. I mean, I'm right now, I'm at Tim Tim and Tito. If you come by, please do. I mean, I like to do by myself. <laughs> so I'm just going to put a little oil on the grill pan and just get it nice and hot. So I put it on medium high heat. So it should take like two minutes. The sear should only take about three to five minutes. Because this one's a little bit charred, it's not overcooked, but because the skin itself was a little bit caramelized more than I like it to because of the convection oven. I'm only going to sear it very briefly on the underside so you can see how the grill marks are forming. And while that's heating up, I'm just going to start heat whipping away. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm right in downtown Detroit right now. If you're in the area, uh, please shoot me a message on uh, Instagrams at The Bachelor Chef or at Salt and Co. S A L T A N D K O. And I will gladly give you a platter to take home with you. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I'm giving it to the people here. Anthony Adams actually right now giving a speech uh, next door. <laughs> Who's running for mayor? Very nice. So I'm gonna put this in a bowl. So we have our greens. That looks great. <laughs> just gonna sit here, enjoy some accomplishments. Now I'm gonna get ready to work on this corner shit. All right, so once the pan is on high, high heat, I gotta high heat the grill pan, I'm moving it to medium high. Since the squeeze are done, I'm going to use the same tongs. Never use chicken with vegetables, but vegetables and chicken is perfectly fine. And I send those here on the side now. And then reduce the heat to medium. And one thing I like to do while things are kind of done and have time, always clean up as you go to save your, to maintain your sanity as you're cooking in the kitchen. Please clean up as you go. And just for demonstration, I wouldn't have all this. I wouldn't have all my um, containers and just dash away and put them back in the cabinet. But always clean up as you go. If you see your dishes, just move along. I try to do like a trail, a little pail like this, and just throw everything in there. Pro tip. It really does make all the difference. It's easier to enjoy your meal when it you're is. not looking at a pile of of, uh, of dishes. Or if you bring somebody over, you tell them to uh, clean up while you cook. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You feed your friends, they take care of you. Also done. There we go. Mashed potatoes. Those look great. <laughs> uh, here, and we'll spend some time. There we go. 
You can see the grill marks. Maybe you can't. Let me move that up. Can you see that? Yep. And so is the grilling, it's just like sealing in the... Sealing in the juices. Okay. The marinade, everything we've done so far. And one thing, one reason why I love Cornish game hens is that you kind of get uh, the best of both worlds. If you like chicken breast, if you like dark meat, you're getting it all. But the thing is, the chicken breast isn't as dry as you put it on a larger bird. So it's not as, uh, it's a bit easier. And it's because it's a game of bird. So this puppy's done. And then I'm going to put this other one in. Um, we have a question wondering if you could broil it as well, or... You definitely can. You can broil okay. it. You don't have to grill it. Um, honestly, I'm just doing this because um, in some of my practices, I like to break it into quarters. So I break this in half as well and break it again. And I just grill them off to sear it. Um, especially if I already pre-cooked them or par-cooked them, and I'm kind of more or less reheating them. But you can actually, once you take them out of the oven, they're actually done as is. This is just an extra step. Broiling, grilling, marking them. Um, any finishing technique you want to do, go for it. Sweet. And that one, you see the color how it's sealed in? Yeah, that looks great. So, I'm going to put this on low, get a fighter for this. There it is. If you wonder where I get platters from or I find different things, um, Home Goods, TJ Maxx, mm -hmm. they're always great suggestions. Do you ever go to the the restaurant supply store on Gratiot too? I, well, the People's Restaurant, I don't go as much uh, because their hours are uh, pretty difficult. Oh, but okay. I do love uh, restaurant uh, suppliers in Southwood. And again, their hours are kind of tough, like it's nearby my house where I live. Yeah. But I usually look at the store. My staff tells me to stop buying stuff because we might already have it or we don't need it. And sometimes both. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our mustard glaze Cornish game hens. Sweet. And so would you, how would you serve that? Would you end up breaking it down even more or? I will put that in half again. I can do that okay. to show you guys. Okay. Get my gloves. At this point, um, it's safe to touch if you're okay with that, but quite frankly, it is pretty hot. <laughs> I even use gloves at home. I'm working with chicken, even for myself. Mm -hmm. Again, like I said, I don't like washing my hands constantly while I'm touching the birds. I just throw the gloves off, rinse them off, wash them, but not worry about all the juices and everything right. taking over. So I'm just going to break this bird down. So the same side where you cut in halfway, we're going to go all the way now. And now we have a nice quarter bird. And this is how I usually serve it for a plate of dinners. Quarter bird and just trim it. And there you go. Let me And if you wanted to break it down even more, would you then? Cut it in half again at the leg. Okay, got it, cool. And I can show you guys how to do that. Let me, get, let me pull this one out. It's actually gonna fall apart itself, but it's so juicy. You're right. So you see how it's just coming apart, it's ready to go. Yep. So it took no time at all. Break through the cartilage. And then you have a little mini chicken quarter. It looks great. And that only took basically what an hour and twenty minutes. Uh, besides That's my wild. Child, mashed potatoes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's it's very easy. Uh, it's simple. Once you do it more, like cooking itself becomes secondhand. Greens itself is just an art form, as you said, the art of raising greens. Uh, once you get the components down, you see it's just very natural. Um, but the real technique is just cutting them down. Uh, it saves a lot of cooking time. A lot of times when you see people doing cobbling, they're big 
uh, big, meaty, or leafy uh, pieces, and they take forever to sit down. But when you get like nice thin strips, they only take about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, but yeah, this is stuff that I make all the time at home or for my clients and for my friends as well. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I enjoy this time with you guys, and I'd love to spend more if you have it. Sweet. Yeah, feel free to drop your questions in the chat if you have them. Sydney says it looks so delicious. Um, and the recording of this class will be available on our YouTube in the next week or so. Um, so if you want to revisit the recipes um, and cook along with Ryan. Um, I'm glad you say it tastes good. So I can control your plate. Katie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Totally. I know well, how I make it, but. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it translates. So that, yes. that's great. <laughs> yeah, and then everyone has the recipes. Everyone should have the recipe in their inbox. If you yes. don't, please uh, shoot me an email, just uh, lola at keepgrowingdetroit.org. Um, and stay tuned. We'll have another cooking class coming up in, I think, the first week in October. Um, and we will be announcing the topic of that in the coming weeks as well. Um, but also, um, can you remind us what your social media handles are, like how we can keep up with what you got going on? Sure. Uh, well, there's three. So there's myself, which is The Bachelor Chef. Uh, we also have Breadless, B-R-E-A-D-L-E-S-S. -S, and there's Salt & Co., S-A-L-T-A-N-D-K-O. Uh, follow all three. I don't say one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Well, we uh, and keep growing Detroit. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Like, you know, the mission. Uh, Lola, can you talk more about that? Because I know a lot of my friends, even outside Detroit, are very interested um, in your mission as well. Yeah, sure. So, Keep Growing Detroit is an organization that is um, cultivating a food sovereign city. We want over fifty percent of the fruits and vegetables grown uh, or consumed by Detroiters to also be grown in Detroit by people who live here as well. Um, basically, we want to have control over our local food system. Um, I think we all kind of had that moment at the beginning of the pandemic or, you know, throughout the pandemic when we uh, felt the vulnerability of our food system. Like, you know, you walk into your grocery store and like there were shelves that were empty. Um, so having control over our food system means that, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to deal with that because our food is growing in our, in our backyard. Uh, food also tastes better. Um, when you know who grew it and where it came from, all that good stuff. So we, our, our largest program is the Garden Research Program, um, through which we support uh, about 2,000 gardens and farms in Detroit, Highland Park, and Hamtramck with seeds, transplants, cooking classes like this one. We have gardening and farming classes, everything from like, you know, beginner gardening classes where folks are like, I can't, like what you were saying, Ryan, like, I can't keep a house plant alive, but I really want to grow tomatoes or something like that. Um, but then we also want to support advanced growers too, who maybe are growing their own transplants at home. Um, so we have a whole host of programming that I definitely encourage you to check out on our website or on our uh, Instagram, Facebook, and um, uh, recordings of classes in the last uh, year and a half are also on our YouTube. So Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, yes. And hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Thank you all so much. Thank you appreciate guys. It. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. It's my first class, so I appreciate you guys being patient with me. <laughs> yeah, you killed it. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night. Peace.